Praise God. God is good. We can all sit. All right. Today uh, we are going to continue on in our series of the Holy Spirit. Right? And it's really been a good series so far. Uh, the first sermon that we heard in this series was a doctrine of the person of the Holy Spirit. All right? He's not just a force. He is not the essence of God. He is not the conduit of power that moves through God, but he is God. He is part of the Trinity. He is the person of the Holy Spirit. We have learned about the day of Pentecost, the sound of the wind, the tongues of fire, the Holy Spirit, the gift, the promise of the Father that came and rested upon the 120 in the upper room. We have learned about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, which fills us for Christ-exalting ministry, right? This is the same empowerment that resulted in 3,000 people being added to the church in one single day. We've also learned the chief office of the Holy Spirit, which is to glorify Christ, and then last week, we have learned that we no longer have the spirit of fear, but we are adopted sons and daughters of God. We are no longer in slavery, but now we are fellow heirs with Christ. So this week, we're going to discuss the Holy Spirit's advocacy in us, how He sustains us, how He sanctifies us, how He keeps us. And how he comforts us. And although it may be counterintuitive, we're going to go to the Old Testament uh, when, we, when we begin to try to understand um, and set forth a solid foundation from which we have the ability to grasp the wonderful truth uh, that is found in the words of Christ in our main scripture for today. But before I continue and before I get into the sermon, let me pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you use me as a vessel. Lord, let me hide behind a cross and let your word come forth, Lord. I pray that those who need comforting are comforted, that those who need help are helped, and those who need you to advocate for them, that they get that advocacy today. They are strengthened, Lord, and I am strengthened through you, through your word and the Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord, we glorify you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. The Word of God, the Scripture, the Bible. For the believer, it is everything, okay? Without it, we are lost. We are 100% lost. We find many reasons not to, read, not to read the Scripture, right? We find many reasons. Uh, one, it's taxing. It's time-consuming. Uh, um, you know, it's boring. It's long. It's, it's hard to understand, Right? Oh, I hear my preacher, so I really don't need to read. Um, and then the worst excuse we could ever think of is, you know, um, God knows my heart. I don't have to read. Okay? He knows my heart. So, you know, he, he understands me. No, we must read the Scripture. Okay? May we never think such things, but may we always be convicted to spend more time in the Word. Not only this, the Old Testament is just as important as the New. Okay? We cannot separate the true, the two. Okay? They cannot be divided. Just as the Heavenly Father God and Christ who sits at His right hand side. They cannot be divided. You cannot separate the New Testament from the Old Testament. Without the both of them... We would never be able to know the true God and His wonderful works. For many Christians, they wonder, why do we need the Old Testament when we're under the new covenant of the shed blood of Christ? The two testaments together are the complete Word of God. Okay? They cannot be separated. They show us the sovereignty of God, the will of God, and the love of God. And it, do, it is all for one sole purpose. It is for glorifying Christ and making known the gospel of Christ. 
Because in the gospel is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. We need to read the scripture. As a believer, the Bible is our physical anchor in which we hold in hands of flesh that all of our hope rests. But if it is never opened and it is never read, then it is nothing more than an anchor without a chain. You throw it over and it won't hold you. You must be in the Word. There is no other text as important as the Scripture. Okay, you, you will never have another book as important as the Scripture. Martin Luther described the Bible this way. The Bible is the cradle wherein Christ is laid. If you love Christ, if you love God, you will read His Word. The sermons of your favorite pastors, the encouragement from your favorite exhorters, and the lyrics of your favorite songs will all fade away. And they will pale in comparison to the glory and the truth that is found in every page of Scripture. Okay, we cannot leave the Word. The words of the world and even this sermon will fade away. But as Christ said in Matthew 24, 35, the heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. The Word of God is where our hope lays. Now, if you are wondering to yourself, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. So why are we talking about the Bible? And we're talking about the Comforter. Why are we talking about the Holy Spirit? 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is God who wrote the Scripture. The Holy Spirit himself guided the hand that held the pen that wrote the Scripture. Therefore, he is part and parcel of the Word of God. You cannot separate the two. Psalms 119. It may have been written by King David. We're unsure. Uh, They even said it could possibly be Ezra, but this, this is not important. What is important in Psalms 119, 105 to 112 is what we read. We find within it a person who is fully dependent. In 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Right? This is an individual that fully submits to the word. Right? This is what he does, who he is. We can quickly look over these words and think, oh, that's some nice poetry. You know, it sounds nice. You know, your word is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. But in reality, what is the author writing? He is saying that your word is a lamp to my feet. You will not let me trip. Okay? I can see where I am placing my feet. And not only that, your uh, uh, light to my path. Okay? So not only do I know your precepts, not only do I know how to walk, where I see where I'm walking, but I see where I am going. Okay, this is what the author is saying. He's also saying without the Lord, without the Word, he would fall and be lost. Okay, his whole dependence is upon the Word of God. Now, what else do we find in this? We find a person who is fully afflicted. In 107, I am afflicted very much, okay? Not just a little, but completely. A person who is completely afflicted, wholly consumed by some form of hardship being placed upon him. Who wants to afflict themselves? okay? Whether it comes from illness, whether it comes from other people, uh, no matter what it comes from, okay? So he is being afflicted. He is more than uncomfortable, okay? He is pressed harshly, okay? It is, it is, he knows that he can't help himself. He cannot rescue himself. He cannot pull himself up by the bootstraps. He cannot propel himself forward, but he is stuck, okay? He is stuck. And we see three things that he depends upon in the Word. 
Because he also says in, in verse 107, Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. He depends upon the word of God to keep him from falling. He depends upon the word of God to guide his way, to light his path. And he also depends upon the word of God to restore him. Everything he needs is coming from the word of God. This is complete trust. Just like trust of a child, where the child trusts the parent for support. We won't let the child fall. For security, we are going to keep the child safe. And also for sustenance, because we will feed our children. This is the same dependence that this man has upon the word of God. And then in 108, what he says next should kind of make us wonder in amazement. Okay, um, his, his next word, except I pray the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord. Right? He's afflicted very much. Okay? He is completely taken over by whatever is put upon him. Okay? But he trusts God without question. Okay? And, and his response is free will offerings. Except, I pray, the free will offerings of my mouth. When under affliction, do we offer God free will offerings? Free will offerings in this context does not mean that it's a festival, that it's some kind of ritual. No, no, no. There is no harvest festival. There is no Pentecost. He is doing this because his heart desires to do it. His will is desiring to praise and to worship God, even in the midst of his suffering. This should remind us of Job, a righteous man. A man who was upright, who hated sin, but when his family was taken from him, when, when he basically had nothing else in Job 1.20, he sa it says, then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. So when affliction comes upon us, what is our response? Is it to offer free will praise and worship to God, or do we allow it to consume us? Do we allow it to take over? You know, his afflictions may have been severe, but they were not strong enough to subdue his faith. He had faith in the Word of God. He had faith in the law and the statutes of God. He had faith that God would see him through, that God could sustain him, and that God would revive him. And where did he get this faith? Through the word of God. Here is a man that seems to be mature. Here is a man that seems to be unshakable, unwavering. Right? We can all look at this individual and say, wow, uh, you know, I wish I was like that. When I, when I went through difficulties, I wish that I, ha I had that kind of faith that would, that would keep me there. Yes. You know, uh, uh, we might even think that, we, that this guy would have known all the Scripture and all the statutes. The way he's speaking, he seems like he's maybe a priest, maybe he's a high priest, right? He knows it all. But what does he say after he offers a free will praise to God? And teach me your judgments. And teach me. He humbles himself and asks God to teach me. We must do the same and teach me. And then in 109... My life is continually in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The New Living uh, Translation says it this way. My life constantly hangs in the balance, but I will not stop obeying your instructions. He understands that if he continues in the path he is going, his life could be taken. He knows that by depending upon the word of God, 
that this can cost him his life. He knows that. But he will not stop. His afflictions are serious and he cannot rescue himself. But he will not forget the word of God. How we could learn from this man's dependency upon the Lord. Right? How often we think we know enough. Right? I know enough. You know what? I've read the Bible. You know what? When I was a kid, I went to Sunday school. Uh, you know, how many years did I read the Bible? I read it every year. It's okay. I really don't need to know anymore. But in reality, we merely have a pinch of understanding. Okay? Just a little pinch. But we think that is sufficient. But how deep and wonderful is the power of the love that God shows us through His Word. We should be grounded in his word. But how quick we forget what we read. We decide, you know what, I'm going to read every day before I go to bed. And we read. And we wake up in the morning. And it's like, where where did I stop off yesterday? We can't even remember where we stopped, right? We can't even remember the verses that we that we read. Right? How weak is our flesh that sometimes sleep is a higher priority than reading the word of God. But do not think that you're alone when it comes to your fight against the flesh, okay? Because there is a need for a helper, okay? There is a need for a helper. Christ dwelt with the disciples for three years. They were eating together. They were praying together. They watched him preach. They watched him teach. They witnessed miracle after miracle, and they still failed Jesus the night that he was betrayed. In Matthew 26, 36 to 38, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. This is Christ, the Savior, who knew that he would be crucified. And he brought the three closest disciples he had and said, come with me. Okay, I need your help. Just pray. Come and watch and pray. And what did they do? In the depths of the Lord Jesus' suffering and at his request, that they should pray, they were unable to do that. They slept. Each time they fell asleep. The next day, the Lord Jesus would be crucified. And the disciples were sleeping instead of praying. Don't think that you're alone in not being able to do things under your own power. Even as Jesus taught all the disciples what was going to happen, that he must go away. Okay? The, the disciples, they became sorrowful, right? Because they, all they heard, they didn't hear anything, but Jesus is leaving. Jesus says, I must go. And their heart became sorrowful. Okay? They could not imagine themselves without Jesus, without their teacher, without their master. Okay? They, they, they couldn't imagine what they would do without his presence. And Jesus says in... John 16, 6 to 7. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. The disciples, they had the desire. They wanted to obey the words of Christ. They wanted to commit themselves but they did not have the ability to overcome the flesh. They needed a strength from within that could defeat the flesh. And that strength would come in the form of the helper. It benefited the disciples with Jesus leaving. And it benefits you that Jesus is not here in the flesh. Because he has made available the helper the Holy Spirit, to each of us. So I want you to fully understand that you are unable to maintain your own salvation under your own strength. 
You need the Helper. So the Father sent the Holy Spirit to dwell with you and to be alongside you and in all of life and through all of life that you may not fall away, that you may be comforted and that you may be encouraged through all the afflictions that life may give you. Okay, this is why the Helper came. In John 14, 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. The word helper in this translation comes from the word paraclete. The word has multiple meanings that help us to further understand the work of the Holy Spirit in each of our lives. Okay? And it helps us to understand how the Holy Spirit ministers to us. They are helper. Advocate and comforter. And to better understand the helper, the advocate, and the comforter, we must understand how the Holy Spirit helps us. He helps us through the same means that the psalmist requested and sought in Psalms 119. When we look at this verse, we can see he will... Teach us all things and bring to your remembrance all things. Is he going to teach us how to fix a car, how to wire a house? No, there must be a qualifier. There must be something that he's going to teach us. Okay? He says, he will teach you all things that I said to you. And bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. The qualifier in this verse is that I said to you. The Holy Spirit will teach us what Christ said, and he will rem bring remembrance to us what Christ said. This helps us to understand the work of the helper, the advocate, and the comforter in our lives. This is why reading Scripture is so very important. This is why we cannot walk away from the Bible. It is crucially and vitally important for every single believer to be grounded and founded upon the Word. It is not an elective. It is not a choice. It is not something we can choose to do and choose not to do. If you love God, you will love His Word. But do not worry. The Holy Spirit is there to help you, and He will Teach you all things that Christ said. There are times that you have to go to commentaries. You go into a verse and you don't quite understand it. So you go to a commentary. Maybe you listen to a sermon to help you understand that very specific verse. Okay? Uh, um, you may have to read the writings of the church fathers uh, uh, 500 years ago, 800 years ago, to try to help you to understand what that verse is saying, to learn the context of when and why that verse was written. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, He will guide you into the truth of Scripture and teach you how to apply it to your life. Okay? The psalmist said in Psalms 119, 108, except I pray the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and Teach me your judgments. This individual understood the word, but he said, teach me. As he rejoiced in praise and prayer to the Father and requested that God teach him the judgments, you also should rejoice at the fact that the complete revelation of God's word through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is available to you. And more than that, Okay. The author of the Word, the Holy Spirit Himself, is there to teach you the Word of God. Okay. It is not that the Word was written and that you were sent on your way, but the Holy Spirit is there to teach you. The question then remains for each of us to ask ourselves, if you are not in the Word, to where will your anchor be fastened when the storms and waves come? When affliction comes, persecution, distress, 
tribulation, danger, illness, when God feels as though he's distant and he's not listening to your prayers, when your heart or your heart just it's, it feels empty as if there's just a void and, and there's nothing there, when your faith is stretched so thin that it feels that it's about to snap, may your trust be found in the word of God. You know, we, we cannot be guided by emotions, okay? We, we must not be guided by emotions, right? They will lead us astray. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Even we, when we come upon that time, won't even understand our own emotions. We stand here and we say, you know what? I know I have faith in God. I feel God's love. I know God. I know that no matter what happens, I will be good. But when that time comes, you don't know. But there is one thing your hope will rest, and that is in the Word of God, that the Holy Spirit, that the Helper, will teach you. And before you say, oh, I could never happen. I have too much faith. You know, I've been a Christian for 20 years. For 20 years, I believed in God. I have a relationship with God. I pray all the time. All of these things. It is the words of David in Psalms 22, verse 1, that Jesus referred to while he was on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? In the time of distress, where will our hope be found? Are you going to depend upon feelings? Well, I feel the warmth of God. I feel His love. You know, I I just feel comfortable. No, when that time comes, we must be found in the Word. But you are not alone when you read the Word. Is it hard to start? Yes. It takes time to get into a rhythm. It takes time to set aside 15, 20, 30 minutes a day to read and to understand the Scripture. Not to read it as if it's just another book, but to read it as it is in the Word of God. But the, but the Holy Spirit, the Helper, He seeks to teach you all things that Christ said. He is waiting for you to ask, Lord, reveal this to me. Help me to understand. How do I apply this to my life, Lord? How can I become Christ-like? How can Christ be the firstborn among many brethren, Lord? I I want to be like that many brethren. I want to be in the Word. Okay? Um, You know, it's, it's important for us to listen to sermons, to listen to exhortations. Okay? It's important for us. But it's not nearly as important as spending time in the Word and in prayer. That the Helper who is already given to you, who already dwells within you, will teach you all things that Christ said. You know, I like the quote from Charles Spurgeon. A Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. So, we need to be in the Bible. Okay? We, we need to pray. Helper, teach me the words. Okay, teach me what Christ said. Teach me your word. And then also, he will bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Okay, this is how the advocate works. Why do we need to bring, why do we need to read? How can you remember what you do not know? How can you have remembrance of something that you never read? Are you going to remember what I said, or Pastor Allen said, or Pastor Aris, or Pastor Renner, whoever your favorite pastor is? Are you going to remember their words? Are their words going to help you when you're like in the pit of emptiness, when everything is falling apart? Oh, I remember what Joe said. No. You will remember what the Word says. Okay? He will bring remembrance to what Christ said, to the Word of God. We need to be found in the Word of God. An advocate is one that speaks up uh, for you, who takes your side in times of need, and he is one who publicly supports. Now, Jesus is our 
faithful, heavenly advocate who sits at the right hand of the Father who is interceding for us this very minute. Okay? In 1 John 2, 1, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have a heavenly advocate for us, right? But also the Holy Spirit is called the advocate. The advocate, the Holy Spirit guides us in our sanctification, in our assurance of salvation, by reminding us of all the promises and the truths of God. Okay, all throughout Scripture. First, he reminds us, for example, that we are free. Okay, he reminds us that we, we are free. For you do not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Right? This is the verse. We, we know this, right? So we're free. Well, he also... When we do sin, He convicts us to repentance. And not only does He convict us to repentance, but also He speaks to us and reminds us that we will be forgiven. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our, our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay? So we're free if we do sin that God will uh, forgive our sins. But, but then, then, well, what if my sin is so bad? What if my sin is so horrible, right? We, we, we think about it and we're like, well, you know what? No, I have faith and I know that I'm forgiven. You know, Peter denied Christ three times by the time the rooster crowed twice, right? Now, imagine the ministry of Peter, okay? Did that stop him? No, because there was no condemnation, Okay? But he carried it with him. You better believe it that Peter knew, I denied Christ the night of, of his most important time, the, the day that he was going to be crucified, I denied him three times. Okay? But was there any condemnation? There is therefore, now, there is therefore no condemnations for those who are in Christ Jesus. So did that stop Peter from his ministry? No because there was no condemnation. When accusations come from the world, when accusations come from Satan, right? When, when, when people are saying things about us, right? The advocate reminds us, take up the shield of faith, which would you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. See, the advocate brings these to our mind. Okay, he brings them up. But if we don't read the scripture, if we don't spend time, how do you know? How do you know what God has for you or what He has done for you? In Psalms 50, 15, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Okay, how do we know that God will deliver us if we don't spend time in the Word? How may the advocate bring to your remembrance that which you have not learned? Spend time in the Bible. Let uh, Learn what God has for you and let the advocate work in you that you may be filled with all peace and may be strengthened by his ministering. And now we'll talk about the comforter, the comforter. How our emotions are fickle. You know, our emotions, they, they come, they go. It's, it's, it's difficult. In Ecclesiastes 3, 4, there's a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. There's different times, okay? As people, some mornings we wake up, we feel great, we want to go to work. Other mornings we wake up, we want to call in and make a sick day, okay? Nothing has changed, only our feelings. Work is the same, okay? Our feelings, they change. The Holy Spirit does not change. The Comforter, He does not change. The Holy Spirit will keep us on the path of righteousness that leads to eternal life. He will not veer to the left. He will not veer to the right. But the Holy Spirit will lead us straight to eternal life. He is never changing. He is never swayed. He is not moved by our temporary emotions or what we're going through. He has a mission to comfort us, to strengthen us, to encourage us, to sanctify us. See, He has come that we may not be swayed. 
that our eyes and our emotions may be focused upon Christ, that we may stand firm under the blood of Christ through the grace of God. We live in a world that is really hostile, okay? Uh, it's really hostile to life. We fall victim of weather, typhoons, tornadoes, wildfires, earthquakes, tsunamis. Even the heat in the Middle East can take your life. The cold can take your life. Diseases coming from mosquitoes. Diseases as simple as COVID, just an airborne, somebody sneezes, you can catch it. I'm pretty sure every single person in here knows somebody that has passed away because of COVID. Okay? So it, it, the world is dangerous. The world is, is, is not a safe place. Even our own bodies can be against us in the form of disease, inborn diseases, genetical diseases, uh, um, hereditary diseases, and, and even cancer right? Our bodies can be against us. We're surrounded by accidental deaths, car accidents, work-related accidents, freak mishaps where something should have never happened, but it did. It takes the lives of many people every day, okay? Lest we forget, man, fallen man is a really scary creature, okay? Fallen man, People abuse the weakest and most innocent of us, right? They do it in sickening tragedies of depravity. Satan and his evil cohort roam around waiting for people willing to act out his will. The innocence of many children, many, many children is broken before they even understand life. A study in the U.S., found that one in five girls and one in 20 boys is a victim of child sexual abuse. They carry that with them for the rest of their life. Self-report studies show 20% of adult females and 5 to 10% of adult males recall a childhood sexual assault or sexual abuse incident. Don't forget most of these are done or performed by family members or very close friends of family. Before we cry out in horror and say, look, that's why we're in church. Okay, look at, look at how evil the world is. Look at how everybody is that don't proclaim the name of Jesus. Just last week, a Christian denomination, a church in the States came under fire and scrutiny because for for decades, they were hiding cases of sexual assault. These traumatic events will stay in the lives of the victims and in their minds for the rest of their lives. They will heal. But forever, almost their entire life, they're going to have trouble having friendships and relationships and trusting people. It will take them years to understand and grasp how to deal with the trauma you see, tra traumatic events are never just physical, okay? They're never just physical. They have very real psychological consequences that can develop themselves in long-lasting, debilitating mental illness. A mental illness can be worse because of the stigma around it. People don't see it, okay? They, they don't understand it. It often goes underreported. Right? And, and this goes on while the people, they, they suffer, the afflicted, they suffer because they, they hold it all inside, and it reveals itself through physical ailments, right? Just in the church alone, if we think about ourselves, right? If, if somebody has a bad tooth, right, and is really causing pain, what do we do? We pray for them, hey, and then go see the dentist, okay? If, if somebody has an illness, we pray for them, and we send them to the doctor, okay? If somebody is suffering depression, oh, God is good. Just pray. Read the Bible, right? Well, the thing is, is it's real. These things are real. The same way we pray and send people to the doctor, we should pray and listen to those who are suffering psychological illnesses, 
Trauma results in psychological illnesses. This is another study. According to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, 61% of men and 51% of women report at least one traumatic event in their lifetime. Depression, 7.2% of Americans. Now, this is all American. I apologize because they just have all the studies. Okay, that's all. Yeah, this is, the studies are there, right? Uh, uh, so, but we, we, we could take this probably as a foundation for all of society, right? 7.2% uh, um, of Americans uh, uh, have reported having major depression episodes. Uh, uh, anxiety disorders has affected 19.1%. Uh, Post-traumatic disorder, PTSD, 3.6%. Okay, uh, uh, the result of trauma, the result of uh, uh, sexual abuse, all these things play together. We can go in with all the statistics and continue on and on and on. But the thing is, I'm just trying to illuminate the fact that this world has fallen and the fact that we are not immune to all of these things. Okay, I am confident that there's three kinds of people in the world. There are those, even in here, who have gone through traumatic events so bad that the emotions have scarred you, and although you've healed, the scar is there, and it will remain for the rest of your life. There are people who are going through these kind of traumatic events now. And then the rest of you are in line waiting for that event to happen. Okay? So how do we, as children of God, process this? How do we just carry on living a normal life? You know, we, we, we don't want to admit, in, you know, to everybody in church. So when people ask us, right, how is everything going? What do we say? Well, we just, we hide it. Oh, God is good. God is good. It is well, right? You know, it is well. We, we don't want to get into it. We, we, we don't want to show, you know, but in reality, in the middle of the night when we go home, we can't sleep. Those, those thoughts of helplessness, despair, grief, anxiety, and depression, they grab a hold of us, they keep us awake, they bother us, they give us doubt, and this is when the comforter steps in. It is at those times that the helper who taught you all three things Christ said will bring remembrance to your mind that you are not helpless, that you are not desperate, that although you are grieving, tomorrow has new mercies, that you are to give your anxieties over to the Lord, and that the depression will go away. And for some of us, for some of us that we know, the afflictions that have come upon us or our friends or our family members they will end in mortality, okay? Some people, the afflictions that they go through are so difficult and so trying that they will lose their life. But this does not mean that they have lost hope because hope and faith in God, they come from the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. In Romans 8:11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So the same spirit that you have in you is the same spirit that raised Christ. So we can trust and we can have faith. And we know this through his word. Now, the scope of this message is not to understand why all bad things happen, nor am I going to try to give you solutions okay, to all of your difficulties. I'm not going to give you some magical Bible verse and say, you read this verse, all your problems go away, okay, because it's not going to happen. I'm also not going to diminish your sufferings. Okay? Uh, um, I, I want you to know that everybody suffers. Okay? Everybody suffers, and it's not fair to try to compare. Well, you know what? You're going through this. But this person has it worse. No. And the reason is because all of our afflictions are all-encompassing. Okay? They encompass every part of us. But also, if we're not grounded in the Word, 
they can become all-consuming. Okay? Uh, uh, but I pray that through this today, that the light may be shown upon the Comforter. That, that, that all of us who suffer, we may take hold of Him and latch on for dear life. Okay? Because it is whom the Helper is given to us. This is our hope. Okay? It is in the Helper. He is all-sufficient. Okay? And, as it says in Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Okay? See, the, the Helper, uh, he, the Comforter, He reminds us of these things. Okay? When we're in the, the, really the depths. Okay? You know our friends, they comfort us. When we're really suffering, our friends come over and they comfort, and we really enjoy it. Okay? But that's a pain reliever, okay? It's a pain reliever, just momentary. Because when they leave, right, the pain comes back, right? The pain, it really comes back. Uh, uh, you know, and sometimes their words, they hurt more than they help, okay? Even like Job's three friends came over, and they ended up hurting worse than they helped. But the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, He is there for you. He will hold you steady. It may take time for you to realize that you're not drowning. It may take time for you to realize that you're not helpless. But the Comforter is with you. He will not leave you. He will teach you all things that Christ said. And He will bring remembrance to all things that Christ said. It may seem peculiar that in your time of need, you desire a relief. Okay? Some kind of reprieve from the affliction of your suffering, but instead pray, Lord, teach me. Bring remembrance, Lord. I don't want to forget your goodness, your faithfulness. Help me to understand. And we do this that we may not fall, but that way we may be strengthened in all of his might. And in conclusion, my dear brothers and sisters, let us be sure of two things. Firstly, difficult and challenging times can come at any moment. And they could even be the result of decisions that we ourselves make. Life can change in an instant, and we must be prepared. Secondly, our strength, our faith is strengthened by the Word of God, as it says in Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Our dependence upon the Holy Spirit to teach, us to, the, to teach us the Word and to bring us remembrance of the Word is more than sufficient to see all perils of life fade away in the light of the glory that awaits us in heaven. We do not have to be overtaken by our afflictions. Remember that our bodies, our flesh, They are fleeting, and they will fade away. As it says in Isaiah 40, 6 to 8, the voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of a field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Our bodies will perish. Our flesh is like that grass. It grows, and the next day is is gone. But the Word of God will not fade. It will not expire. And the paraclete, the helper, the advocate, the comforter will never leave the children of God because we are sealed by Him. As it says in Ephesians 1.13, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Promise. You know, this, this promise, this word in, in the Greek is Erebon. And it stands for engagement ring. Okay? So he is the one who gave us the engagement ring of the Holy Spirit to keep us. to to hold us so that we we know that we are children of God. So we are sealed by Him. We are being sanctified by Him. And we will also be glorified by Him. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, we thank you for the Comforter, for the Paraclete. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we pray that you give us a heart to love your word, a heart that cries out, that needs your word, Lord. We, we, we want to be convicted when we don't read. We want to be convicted, Lord, when we spend time doing other, ti- other things than spending time in your word. Because, Lord, when the time of difficulty comes, Lord, when affliction comes upon us, it is your spirit, the Holy Spirit. It is the helper who will teach us. It is the advocate who will remind us. And it is the comforter, Lord, who will guide us and who will help us help to relieve the pain, not through emotions, but Lord, by your word. And your word is truth and your word is life. May we hold it close to us and never let go. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.